Now, for the last talk of this session, before we go into our elite panel discussion, I invite Dr. Rahul Menon to talk on endogenous endophthalmitis. How did it intrude? Dr. Rahul is consultant with retinal surgeon at Chaitanya Eye Hospital, Ernakulam. <coughs> So good evening everyone. So I'll be talking today about endogenous endophthalmitis. So it's, it occurs from hematogenous spread of organisms from a different a distant source of infection. Accounts for about 2 to 8 percent of all endophthalmitis. Pediatric endogenous endophthalmitis is even rarer. So these are the various risk factors which include chronic diseases, uh, patients on chronic immunosuppressive therapy, uh, intravenous drug abuse and so on. Now, Unlike exogenous endophthalmitis, in endogenous endophthalmitis, the choroid and ciliary body are the first site of ocular infection because of the higher blood flow. And then the retina and vitreous have a secondary involvement. It is associated with a very high complication because about four, uh, studies have shown that around 14 to 43 percent of the patients end up requiring enucleation or evisceration. Now it can be unilateral or bilateral. There's a, uh, many studies have said there's a right eye predominance because of a more proximal and direct blood flow from the internal carotid artery. It can also spread directly from the CNS via the optic nerve. Now, the microbial source of endogenous end of, end, end of thalmatis significantly varies in different parts of the world. Fungal end of thalmatis is more common in the Northern, North America where IV drug abuse has been uh, implicated as one of the cause and Canada has been, is the most common factor, uh, uh, organism isolated. In Eastern Asia, it is a gram-negative bacteria and Klebsiella and ammonia has been the most common uh, 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 associated organisms. Bacillus group has been associated with IV drug abuses. Now, as we've seen, geography plays a very important role in identifying the etiology for endogenous endophthalmitis. So, we have this excellent 10-year study from Shankar Netrale. So, they studied 61 eyes of 58 patients in which about 46% of the patients had no predisposing condition. Culture positive was found in 58% uh, of which gram positive organisms were 15.5 and gram negative were 34.5. Gra Pseudomonas aeruginosa was the most common isolate and in, in the end 12 eyes had to be eviscerated. Now these patients tend to have a poor visual outcome because of the invasive nature and a non-specific presentation causing a very de a delayed diagnosis. Also, uh, Limetol has found that intravital antibiotic therapy or vitrectomy, both still, even if we get the best treatment, they end up, tend to have a very poor visual outcome. But however, the rate of, what they found was the rate of evisceration was lower in uh, patients who underwent vitrectomy. Now, the, in microbiological histopathology, the infective foci has been localized to the inner choroid from which it extends to the Brooks membrane, retina and eventually involves the vitreous. Isolated retinal lesions can also be identified in about 14% of the cases. Now, uh, uh, vitrectomy has a, in, in microbial culture, vitrectomy has a higher diagnostic yield for culture compared to vitreous aspirate. Now, the possible reason could be during vitrectomy, we can take the sample closer to the retinal surface because unlike, like I said, unlike the exogenous uh, endophthalmitis, in the endogenous, the infection is from inside out. PCR analysis has a very keen, uh, 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 key uh, 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 role in uh, the, the analysis. Uh, uh, it has very high increase uh, sensitivity. Like Soma and group had found that in their cases, they could identify infection in about 100% of the cases compared to, to culture where they could only identify the organism in 37.5%. Also, the very uh, great thing is the rapid diagnosis. It takes about 90 minutes to get a report. Now, the only limitation being we are unable to determine the antibiotic susceptibility with the PCR. Now, the management uh, is simple aqueous and uh, we have to take an aqueous or vitreous tab, send it for microbi uh, microbiological analysis. Systemic therapies definitely have a, has a key role in endogenous endophthalmitis because it treats both the remote and ocular foci. And also, since the bl blood ocular ba uh, barrier is broken, the drug can achieve a therapeutic concentration in the eye. Oral steroids is extremely controversial because the, most of these patients tend to uh, be in a state of systemic sepsis. And also, unlike the uh, post-operative endophthalmitis where toxins play a key role, here the, uh, the, one of the pathogens is septic emboli. So steroids are usually not uh, preferred. So the treatment includes, we have two options, intravital injections or vitrectomy. 
No, usually an, you suspecting a bacteria infection, we treat with ba uh, intravital vanco or ceftine imipenem. The intravital antifungals are little, uh, giving, uh, talking about it in detail. So we have the polyins like amphotericin B, in which uh, they have studies have showed that about 2200 micrograms have shown no toxicity, but the usual dose that we give is about 5 to 10 micrograms per 0.1 ml. Triazos like Vorganazole are broad, uh, broad uh, based uh, 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 antifungals. The concentration of less than 250 milligrams, up to 50 micrograms have been uh, well tolerated and the dose that we give is about 50 to 100 micrograms. Fluconazole has a response rate of more than 90% and uh, the dose that we give is about 100 micrograms per 0.1 ml. Very few data is, uh, uh, there are few newer antifungals such as poscanazole uh, which is, has a very good uh, activity against fusarium but it is available as an old suspension and very few data av av available whether it can be used as an intravital agent. Flu cytosine has, uh, has a very good action against candida, but it should not be used as a sole therapy. It should be used only as an adjunctive treatment. Now, the systemic antifungals usually it requires a minimum uh, duration of six weeks uh, treatment. Depends upon the resolution of ocular lesion. Severe involvement usually requires a longer duration of treatment. Uh, fluconazole has a good activity against candida. Itraconazole can be used for aspergillus and fusarium. Amphotericin B, uh, given systemically, has a very poor ocular penetration. Now, vitotomy for endogenous endocrine metis, uh, I don't need to talk out much about EVS study as Dinesh sir has already given a very detailed, uh, elaborate uh, explanation of the same, but it was not included in EVS study. Now, when I was researching for uh, this endogenous endocrine metis, many studies, like, you know, uh, articles, they kept mentioning, popping up that EVS has not, uh, you know, uh, 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 given, uh, like, you should only operate on a case for uh, hand movements or uh, light perception, which uh, sir has already cleared. But, you know, I feel uh, we have a lower threshold for uh, vitretomy now in cases of endophthalmitis. Not endogenous, any vitretomy, if we see suspecting endophthalmitis, we tend to lower threshold, we try to go in earlier. So, uh, the pros of vitretomy is we get a better diagnostic sensitivity. And there, there also, like the uh, limbs study, we have uh, uh, shown, we, they have shown that there is a reduced chance of enucleation or evisceration. The only cons is, uh, it's easier said than done because most of these patients would be usually in ICU admitted patients and you know the poor systemic status. It is very difficult to get a fitness for uh, vitretomy. And also finally even after undergoing vitretomy, uh, you know, uh, we can always, make some, some people can always argue what is the point because you are not uh, saving, the visual, uh, vision, saving the vision of the patient. Now uh, a disclaimer, I'm going to stick my neck out here, okay. <laughs> Don't slaughter me in the panel uh, discussion. Covid, I this is a very interesting article I came across and being a such a, you know, platform, I definitely like to put it across. I know, uh, you know, uh, many people might go against me or like probably slaughter me over here. Next, I'm expecting a very good slaughter from Dinesh right away. So, Covid and iodine has been used as an ocular antiseptic for long. Now, this Japanese group, what they did was, they gave intravitreal injection of Covid and iodine, okay, as an intravitreal injection technique and also they used it as an irrigating solution for vitrectomy. So, they had taken about nine, uh, nine eyes of eight patients, of which three eyes were endogenous endophthalmates. That is the only reason I'm including it in this talk, uh, st talk of mine. So, how did they prepare the injection? For they, what they found out was 1.25% of covid and iodine has no ocular toxic, uh, uh, retinal toxicity. So, they, take, they have taken 1 ml, 0.1 ml of uh, ten percent povidin iodine, sterile povidin iodine. That has to be very clear because the the ones we have opened up, they are very uh, prone to get contaminated with pseudomonas. So they have taken 0.1 ml of uh, povidin iodine, mixed it with 0.7 ml of saline, make it 0.8 ml, mix it well, uh, take take off 0.7 ml and inject 0.1 per ml again into the eye. And for uh, the uh, irrigation solution during vitrectomy, what they did is they took 1.25 ml of ten percent povidin iodine. Mix, mix it with 500 ml of BSS plus solution. So the effective concentration of the fluid is 0.025%. Now, so like I told before, uh, like even when I looked at the article, I was like, you know, how, how safe would it keep, could it be in the uh, eye? And they have they at least documented that they have uh, received an uh, approval from the ethics board. So what they found out was, even after doing all this procedure, the cell density, spec in specular microscopy, the cell density was maintained about 2300 per square millimeter in all the cases. And actually, it became feasible in many of the cases after the treatment. In Gorman perimetry, they found no apparent visual field defects, except in two cases where there was retinal whitening due to endophthalmitis. And also in ERG recording, there was no significant dip difference in the amplitude or the implic time 
in any of the components between the affected eye and the uh, treated affected eye and uh, the healthy fellow eyes. So key points of the study, what, what I found was the half-life of intravitreal uh, povidin iodine is three hours. On an, an, as an irrigating solution vitrectomy, the efficacy only lasts for 15 minutes. So it is short acting. Now, the best thing about it is the rapid bactericidal effect. It takes only 15 seconds to kill the bacteria, whereas it takes 8 hours for the vancomycin to start killing the bacteria. Also, because of its bactericidal effect, even multi-drug resistant bacteria are not a problem for it. And drug resistance is not an issue. So my take home message, it is site threatening condition associated with high mortality. It requires a team approach of ophthalmologist and an infectious disease physician. Technically difficult to treat because of the delay by the time it, the patient reaches to us. And, and you know, even if you start a treatment, to get the clearance is always a hurdle to us because of the systemic issues. Early vitrectomy is always better for both diagnosis as well as treatment. And very aggressive treatment is warranted. Thank you. Thank you, Dr.